The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. Henry Kissinger, John Paul Sartre, Arthur Schlesinger. These and other so-called public intellectuals have influenced public discourse in profound ways. But as society changes, are public intellectuals becoming an endangered species? To find out, Policy Watch is joined this week by Amitai Etzioni, director for the Center for Policy Research and professor at George Washington University. And now, the host of Policy Watch, Doug Besherov. Amitai Etzioni, welcome to the University of Maryland and Policy Watch. Thanks for having me. Delighted to have you here today to talk about public intellectuals. Now, you've put together this really wonderfully thoughtful book. It's called Public Intellectuals, an Endangered Species. But before we decide whether they're endangered, I thought we should find out what they are. So let me start with a quotation from one of the contributors to the book, and then I'll ask you whether you agree, and I'll ask you if you would elaborate, and then we'll talk from there. And this is from Judge Posner, and he says, by a public intellectual, I mean someone who uses general ideas, drawn from history, philosophy, political science, economics, law, literature. Ideas that are part of the cultural tradition of the world to address contemporary events, usually of a political or ideological flavor, and does so in the popular media, like TV that we're on now, uh, whether in the form of op-ed pieces, television appearances, signing full-page advertisements, or writing magazine articles or books addressed to a general audience. Now, we asked you to be on the show because not only did you put together this book, but you are usually listed as a public intellectual. So, sir, Professor, what is a public intellectual? Uh, no, I, I think the quote is uh, good enough. And before we get much further, I should say, this setup I'm not completely comfortable with. It should be the other way around. I should be interviewing this public intellectual. But uh, since uh, we set up this way, let me at least for now, I play my uh, role as designated. It, really, it's, I think it's helpful to think about public intellectuals somewhere between the academic researcher or scholar and the talking head uh, on uh, uh, television. Because let's take the subject of privacy. The uh, a scholar would say that you can't discuss such a subject. It's much too diffuse and broad. There are, there are different societies. There are social concept of privacy, there are legal concepts. You can discuss the concept of privacy in the United States, maybe over the last 20 years, maybe. So, as we said, you know, more and more about less and less. Uh, the talking head will say that privacy is kaput, it's uh, uh, destroyed by whatever, the Bush administration or whatever. Wait a minute, by the you, left. Of a, you just stuck something in this conversation, a talking head. Tell us about talking head. Talking head is the people you see on television who uh, you know, on uh, fire, cause fire or one of those things, or sometimes on the morning shows. And uh, they are really, uh, t most of them television personalities who are uh, every day have to opinionate on something else. And uh, uh, they kind of do the opposite of the academic scholar. They are uh, uh, ocean wide and, and skin deep. Now, I, I, I said something to a previous guest of ours, uh, Judith Martin, Miss Manners. I said, uh, well, what about how rude those TV programs are? She said, well, those aren't scholars. Those are, those are just, that's entertainment, she said. So is a, you don't have to say yes to this, but is a talking head anything more than entertainment? Well, they, they express uh, opinions, and when they express opinions about matter of public policy, uh, then uh, I think that they have uh, a tidbit of this thing we're talking about, that they are in that game. And, uh, you know, Shakespeare was entertaining, so the fact that something is entertaining doesn't immediately uh, disqualify it as having some kind of a 
uh, content merit. And so. But the public intellectual is somewhere in the middle, so uh, she will be both, as uh, uh, Judge Posner said, uh, general, but I think a little more nuanced uh, than your uh, average soundbite. So uh, I, public intellectual talk about privacy I may point out that it's a value which uh, Barrington Moore uh, found in, in effect in practically all societies studied, including early and later in today's, that the, the, as a legal concept, it's a, actually surprisingly new one that it, uh, most people don't realize. They will say that uh, it's not as much as mentioned in the Constitution. It was created uh, some 40 years ago, 1965, uh, out of whole cloth, or some other way of putting it. Wouldn't be the only legal doctrine that came from emanation. Exactly. And that uh, now we have this debate whether it's waning or, or not, and then he would go from there. So he stays on a general level, but he's mindful of nuances uh, and scholarship. It's a kind of in between or torn in both directions as you wish to. I felt that, um, I felt the absence of a public intellectual helping in a recent Supreme Court decision. This was one about thinking about privacy, consent to search. I don't know if you're familiar with this case, but the Supreme Court had to decide um, whether having one person in the House say to the constable, come on in, was enough. Uh, the law had always been that it only needed one person, the law of most states, one person. The Supreme Court, in what I thought was an interesting lack of intellectual heft, said, no, a man thinks his house is his castle, or a woman thinks a house is her castle, and it doesn't much matter what the other person there thinks. And that was the level of discourse. And I would have liked a serious constitutional scholar or a person like Amitai Etzioni to say, well, let's think about this in a broader context. And they didn't have that help. And there was nothing on TV or in the press to help me on that. Well, uh, when you get to legal proceedings, then they're also often uh, technical and, uh, the, in effect, the Supreme Court often tries to find a narrow ground when it doesn't want to go and make a major uh, change in public perception of uh, policy. But I th actually, it's a very interesting subject because I can see or hear a public intellectual saying that uh, we used to hold that a person's home uh, is their castle and uh, there ain't no way to interfere or uh, n even necessarily know what's happening uh, in their home. That's the ultimate place you're private. You may not be as private in your car. You may not be as private in the street for sure, but in your home you're protected. And in, interestingly, with the feminist movement, we said very moment that it's no longer acceptable. There are certain things which happen in the, in the household. For instance, if a husband abused their wives, we're going to say, I'm sorry, it happened in the house, it happens behind closed doors, but it is the public business. So this notion that what happened inside the house or in, in the privacy of the bedroom even is nobody's business, uh, I don't think it's widely accepted anymore. And I would be surprised to learn that somebody in the court will simply flatly still rely on this. It's not just a feminist. And just, uh, when we are allowed the police to go and plant a bug, uh, a listening device into mafiosos' home, uh, if a child is abused, we surely uh, will want to know. We'll send the social workers to investigate. So we, we're way beyond the point we simply took it simplistically. It's your home, and nobody is allowed to peep. Now, if I want to get the, that kind of understanding, besides going on your website. Where do I go in today's society for that kind of understanding about a Supreme Court decision, about, well, whatever, immigration, about whatever? Where, where do I go for that kind of broader view? Well, that's why I appreciate the opportunity to be here by I put this book together uh, about public intellectuals because I do differ on this issue very strongly with Judge Posner who basically uh, argued in his book that uh, public intellectual are endangered species, that they are uh, disappearing on us, and the few are left are really kind of uh, very uh, weak ones. He, he had to have in his book a list of 500 public intellectuals. So this is About 20% of them were dead, however. That's true. It leaves only 400. <laughs> it's a larger number than zero. Anyhow, uh, we don't need them in huge amounts to be effective. Uh, but uh, I think uh, if you go... Uh, and look, first of all, uh, some of them are uh, on campuses. So uh, there are pockets on the campus where they thrive, like uh, uh, the Committee of Social Thought in Chicago is a 
uh, Bloom written his book and such, is famous for this. Some in law school, and, and we may not love them all, but Alan Dershowitz, I think, qualifies. And then uh, some of them in public policy schools, some of them in think tanks, uh, some of them in editorial or, uh, of major publications. So, uh, it, first of all, uh, you will go to the, pla to the place, to the habitat, mm -hmm. uh, where they kind of uh, thrive and sometimes multiply. And then uh, uh, you have a problem in, in when you go to the library or to the bookstore because there's usually not a shelf for them. They're usually put into the, whatever the bookstore decides a specialized category. So you may have to go to philosophy or religion uh, to find them. Uh, but I tell you, another criteria, if you run your finger down uh, the uh, newspapers, what the New York Times or the Washington Post and such review, you'll find among them, you know, maybe every tenth book is by a public intellectual. Now, as we think about public intellectuals, they are, as you mentioned, the great translators. Mm -hmm. The translators of a broad range of academic thought into something. Maybe they're even the synthesizers of a great deal of thought and then present it to the public. Is that what you're saying? I hope they do more than that. Uh, now, I, I, I very much agree with you that it would be very desirable if they are informed and mindful of what various academicians, in the, when you write you know, about family policy or welfare, you, know, you uh, draw on uh, various research aside of uh, your own. So surely that is part of their uh, sources. But there is a transition here, which is exactly what the researcher cannot do, where you have to go beyond the data. Because if you're just going to try to piece the data together, those of us who do this for all too often, then uh, the data will carry only that far. And if you want to uh, make a, an overarching statement, which uh, a citizen who needs to vote or a president has to make a decision, uh, be able to draw on, you will be able to say, well, uh, this one study showed and the sample wasn't perfect, while the other studies, which was done earlier, uh, with all that appropriate hedging, which uh, appears in, a, in the academic dialogue, you'll have to say, all right, now I examined all that, uh, but uh, looking into history, looking into uh, the values are involved, uh, given all the qualifications, I believe, whatever you understand. And that makes a lot of sense to me, but here's what happens as I watch people who call themselves or are thought of as public intellectuals. There isn't a study, or I've looked at the studies, and I've looked into all this, and here's my conclusion. And I often feel as if the conclusion was pre-established, pre-ordained. Um, I don't feel a no tr neutrality in this decision making. No, it is not. But uh, this is just one step. The process is really not a different, uh, I think it's a fair and analog to a lawyer make a statement in the court. Then comes the other lawyer. Uh, and then out of this uh, dialogue, uh, sometimes heat and sometimes light arises. So a public intellectual will say, I've looked at the data and in other considerations, and uh, I concluded that, uh, I don't know, democratization overseas is really dangerous for the United States' interest uh, because it brings to the fourth uh, radical anti-American mm -hmm. forces in the previous fashion that we should go and democratize the world. Uh, I think it was uh, misbegotten. And then will come somebody from the other side and will say, oh, no, wait a moment, uh, this is just a temporarily a childhood disease, this, this radicalization this society is going through due to recent new democratization, they're going to live through it and soon they're going to become uh, lovely Swiss of Sweden, American-like uh, democratic uh, strongholds. And, and then the conversation will continue. And while it often seems that all you have here is kind of different people screaming at each other or, or talking to each other, in the end of such dialogues, uh, some new light arises. So after a while, people say, you know what, I think the proponents of the arguments and the evidence is on the side of uh, one of those arguments. Now, do I hear an echo of Martin Buber in there? Well, thank you. Yeah, uh, I did st start my studies at the feet of Martin Buber in the last two years he was teaching, and uh, he strongly believed in dialogue uh, as uh, bringing it to the forefront, uh, bringing to the surface uh, truth. And it, it doesn't jump full cloth out of somebody's mouth, but uh, it's for a social problem. And I understand how that would work, but there's, a, I think, an infamous example of uh, the contrast between, for example, Sartre and Camus. 
Sartre defending the communist system after the Stalinist camps were well known, and Camus being unable to do that. Of course, he didn't like the capitalist system either, and he said, a plague on all your um, homes and so forth. But Sartre we think of as a public intellectual, and yet I read his work and I say, he's not telling me about the biggest fact. Well, there are now a whole other bird called ideologues. Uh, on apologists. Um, and in fact, there's an interesting uh, parallel here. The Old Testament distinguishes between true prophets and false prophets. Uh, false prophets usually work for the government. Today, we would call them spin doctors, who kind of uh, uh, support whatever the government does. Some people would support whatever the Communist Party does. So I think these were hacks or ideologues. I mean, not sort of, but people who do that regularly. And they would just uh, uh, try to whitewash and uh, explain uh, whatever if, uh, the, the organization. So I'm, I feel a need to show a little bit of my small reading on this subject and a little bit of my education. But Jeremiah in the Bible, uh, a public intellectual? Well, he, he was an advocate, among other things, of social justice. But most important is uh, he challenged the king. He, he challenged the authority uh, in the name of pe uh, people, but it, in, in, sense, in that sense what the Lord uh, thought uh, was uh, the right. So the does, it, does a public intellectual have to challenge authority? In a sense, yes. Uh, there's no need for for some uh, public intellectual to go and say that whatever was happened last week in Iraq or, or whatever, mm -hmm. no child left behind is uh, God's gift to mankind, and the the king or the governor or the president. Uh, I can walk on water and never make a mistake. We don't need public intellectual for this. We have uh, PR firms for that. So the public intellectual uh, job is to challenge. Now, he may challenge the opposition. He, he may challenge uh, what uh, liberals have to say. But his purpose is to probe the consensus. That's really, for me, the one thing I would add to Judge Posner. See, we all, all our societies, once in a while, actually often, lock into what we call our community of assumptions which we all agree that uh, what's happening has a certain format, and we become so locked into it that we are no longer willing to listen to any other evidence uh, to the contrary. So, for instance, uh, in 1947, uh, George Kennan, a famous public intellectual, wrote that very well-known article in Foreign Affairs, Signing X, in which he uh, redefined the world as we knew it. I mean, and up to that point, we had kind of alliance with the Soviet Union, uncomfortable one, fighting the Nazis, but they were our allies. And he recast them as our enemy and they started the Cold War and the whole idea that we have to contain them. And that led to a major, major change in the way Americans saw the world. And for the next 40 years, we spent uh, hundreds of billions of sacrificed lives all based on this view of communism. Now, then uh, the communist bloc started falling apart. There was a break with Yugoslavia first and then between China and the Soviet Union. And by and large, the American public refused to accept that that was happening because they, they knew communism was a very tricky, uh, devious beast who would probably were just putting up to fool us. And it took uh, a, another public intellectual, Kissinger, which, is, which ended up with Nixon going, the opening to China, to, to break this uh, monolith and again recognize the world is more complicated, more pluralistic, which led to a whole change, very gradual. So uh, the public intellectual doing their job best when they take things we all take for granted, we're no longer willing to look at it, and they encourage us, sometimes force us to re-examine those assumptions. Now, we had another group of people in the public mm -hmm. who were intellectuals, so I'm going to wait to see whether you call them public intellectuals, uh, who turned our policy around. We call them neocons or neoconservatives, and they took a position about Iraq mm -hmm. and about democracy, and they turned the ship of state around, if not public opinion. No, I think the neoconservatives or the neocons are a stellar example of uh, how public intellectuals can take an established framework, a, a community of assumptions, and uh, break them and uh, cast a, a new one. By the way, it's much easier to break the old one than to get us to cons agree on a new one. And it's a fairly dramatic shift. Uh, I'm not talking so much recently about Iraq, but if you roll the tape back to the 1960s, uh, actually, just uh, some studies came out of this. There really were no conservative intellectuals of any visibility. Liberals owned the turf. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to move from there 
to a point where uh, neocons and other conservatives became the dominant uh, public intellectuals, uh, one uh, uh, large segment of the public uh, mind uh, is, is a dramatic uh, change. And the turning point came around that issue of uh, can the government be a social uh, change agent? In your book, mm -hmm. uh, there's a chapter by Tevi Troy. Right. And he talks about uh, the outreach to intellectuals during the Kennedy administration, yes. Arthur Schlesinger yes. and so forth, uh, who became a bit of a spin doctor, in my opinion, but we don't have to go there. Uh, but he makes the point it was much easier in 1960 to be an ambassador to the intellectual academic world because they were all liberals and so forth. There wasn't the other side. And he draws the distinction between that and now, where there is this division among intellectuals. Uh, so the neocons used to like to say, ideas have power. What are the ideas on the horizon that are going to have power as we look into the 21st century? Uh, well, I contemplate this question <laughs> with all the 30 seconds I have. Let me quickly add that the, the Kennedy story is a really very interesting story because unlike most societies, uh, the American society, the separation of elites, as we like to say, uh, was much sharper that the governing elites and the intellectual elites really for a long part uh, of American history did not overlap, unlike if you lived in Jerusalem or Moscow or London or Paris where they all the time had with each other and even changed positions. Public intellectual became ministers, ministers became professors. We did not have that very much until the Kennedy era. And the Kennedy is considered the first to, rather than run away from public intellectuals, uh, to bring them into the White House and such. There's, I completely agree with you that once they became defenders of of whatever he was saying, they became somewhat of a spin doctor. Now, where we go from here, ah, if I knew that answer. But uh, the one thing we can point to, the, some of those questions which uh, uh, concerned us since the founding of the Republic or before uh, are still very acute. And so the question is, um, can we have a foreign policy which is both realistic and moral? It's very much an issue we've been struggling with all our life, and it's become very acute uh, again, the question at home of the limits of social change, uh, uh, the uh, very complicated story, in effect, of post-Katrina uh, shows how difficult it is for, you know, for us to come to terms where we need to engage in, in a major reconstruction. Are we going to go back? Are we going to create a new city and so on and so on? And last but not least, the tension between security and civil rights uh, is, is a genuine one. I think it's sometimes overstated. But uh, it's going to stay with us as long as the war against terrorism is going to stay with us. Let's talk for a moment about public intellectuals in government. You went into the government as a public intellectual. When you were in the government, were you either public or an intellectual? Well, uh, first of all, I, I need to explain because I don't want people to think I was in the wrong White House. <laughs> I, I was in the Carter uh, White House. Uh, believe me, every time I go to Europe, that's my first sentence. <laughs> so. Um, now, no, I was not. I, I, it was absolutely impossible for me to say anything, in effect, anything in public. Uh, and the one time I did, I got into terrible trouble because it was printed in the newspaper and it wasn't the party line. This, this was the business about the family conference? That's right. And then uh, I uh, did write. Uh, I, I wish you'd say, a reporter asked you, uh, well, what about the family conference? And you said, well, it's not our highest priority. I, I don't remember whether there were hostages at the time, but there were certainly major world problems. Uh, and you see, if you're not talking about the family, the family is very high enough. If you're talking about a conference about the family, just a bunch of people yakking about the family. And uh, next, next day, it said in the Wall Street Journal, uh, 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 Governor Reagan, it was running at the time against Carter, uh, says the White House is just paying lip service to the family. Professor Etzioni, senior advisor to the White House, agrees. He says it's not our first priority. The guy quoted me accurately, but uh, by juxtaposition, the two uh, statements, uh, he um, made me, he put me, you know, into the woodshed and for a whole week, and uh, I was very lucky not to give my walking papers. Now, we've had some quintessential public intellectuals in the White House. We talked about Arthur Schlesinger. People mentioned Pat Moynihan, and there are others, of course. Uh, but it does seem with each one of their experience that the lesson is, uh, don't go into the White House unless you are fully prepared to change roles. That's right. Uh, in effect, let's raise a point which I think deserves emphasis. 
uh, being a public intellectual is somewhat like a movie star. Uh, you don't own it. It's not like, you know, you, you're a public intellectual and there's like a title. From then on, you're going to be a uh, public intellectual. It, it comes and goes. And so if you haven't written a decent book for the last five years, you know, or ten, and then, uh, you know, you were a public intellectual. Uh, if you did uh, only meticulous research, then, you know, or if you served in the White House for four years, uh, I think you lost your public intellectual credentials. You may retrieve them. So it's like doing another good movie. So, uh, it, but anybody who goes into the White House, if you accept my definition, that's a person to challenge uh, basic assumptions. If you do it in the privacy of the uh, Oval Office, it's still a pu public intellectual. So you, you check your public intellectual credentials at the door, and hopefully they're still there when you leave. Yeah, hopefully. Well, happily for you, uh, you either were able to preserve them or you were able to renew them ra rapidly. Well, I published my memoirs. So. <laughs> Amitai Etzioni, thank you very much for being with us and for discussing this very important topic. Thank you for excellent questions. <laughs>